Singapore, early December 1941. The great naval base and headquarters of SEAC, Singapore, cosmopolis of the East. Malays, Chinese, Indians and British have taken time by the forelock and the shops and market stalls dazzle the eye. Their hopes were high as the two most powerful battleships of Britain pulled into the naval dockyard. The threat of Japan loomed, but Singapore's people were confident that the considerable firepower of the British ships Repulse and Prince of Wales would prevent any show of force. But all their hopes were dashed. It's hard to imagine that on these peaceful waters, just 70 years ago, a terrible battle was fought. It was the first major blow to the British campaign in Malaya. Over 800 lives were lost, and this changed the course of World War II in Singapore forever. I'm about to enter these seas off the coast of Northeast Malaysia with my team of divers from the Living Seas. We are here to plunge to the depths of history and take a second look at the British renowned class battle cruiser, the HMS Repulse. And in the course, understand what happened in the months before the Japanese captured Singapore in 1942. hundred men lost on a miscalculation. Imagine if they'd had more naval support, air cover. Could the British, could we really have defended Malaya? And it is that challenge that we, the people and the fighting forces in our own blood, our unremitting effort and our stern sacrifice must forever answer. They steamed into Singapore on the 2nd of December 1941 with a jubilant reception from the public. The pride of the British Navy consisting of four destroyers, the Express, the Lecturer, Vampire, Tornadoes, and a brand new battleship, Prince of Wales. Among them was the aging battlecruiser Repulse, a ship that struck fear among the Germans. And six days later, the ship was bombed. All hope for a credible defense of Singapore was lost.
It has been 70 years, and we have all heard the story of Force Z. The story of a small group of warships sent up north to ward off Japanese aggression. Only to be caught in a calculated, synchronized, full-scale invasion that took them by surprise. The bravery, the courage of the men who lost their lives defending Malaya, defending Singapore. That's what we want to recapture. And it starts with our dive to seek the HMS Repulse. I'm Leon Boy, and I'm a dive instructor with the Living Seas. My aim is to provide the highest standard of dive education to those who are passionate and serious about diving. So it seems only fitting that the former students of the Living Seas, like Dag, Alan and Gemma, have now become part of the core group of divers. Okay, let's have a look at these. We dive under the standards set by GUE, or the Global Underwater Explorers. This is a scuba diving organization founded by Jared Jablonski and his team of divers who pioneered cave diving in High Springs, Florida, an area quite far away from the ocean. The idea was to map the waterways of Florida for educational reasons. This also meant a highly experienced team of divers working together needed a standardized diving system that could be used for the most demanding technical dive to a recreational dive. And that's the spirit we have among our group of divers. We are planning a technical trip to dive the wreckage of the HMS Repulse, a British battle cruiser that was sunk in the early days of World War II. Among the 20-member team, the core divers are Dag, the physics professor by day and cameraman by night. He will be filming the underwater sequences of our dive. Alan, our resident history buff, and Gemma, my right-hand woman. Thanks we'll so. go down first yeah. to set all that up, then maybe your group can come mm. down next. Sure. Well, I waited since I was 20 years old to dive on this wreck. Looking forward to this one, man. A dive like this requires a massive amount of planning. I start making the calls to the MV dive race one of my favourite boats to check its availability. Yeah? Yeah, Lionel. Uh, just uh? wanted to check with you about that uh, October trip, the tech trip that we have coming up on the dive, MV dive race. Uh, uh. Uh, okay, so the dates I have are the 26th to the 30th of October. Is that okay? Can, 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 can. Okay, uh, you just Put, uh, put down those dates for me, I'll send you more details when I have it. Uh. Okay, ma. Okay, okay, thanks, man. Alright. Bye. Alright, bye. Bye. I have settled on late October, just before the monsoon season starts in November to February. Visibility should be good, and it's the perfect time for the last technical dive of the year. I'm pretty serious about underwater photography and with my new DSLR, I'm ready to test out shooting underwater. However, I wasn't always among the experienced divers. I remember the first time I came to Leon's dive school. I had a very bad experience diving in Thailand and was lucky to emerge alive. When I came back to shore, I wanted to continue this sport but safely. I typed in Google Safe Diving and the first thing that popped up was Living Seas. Then I met Leon. That charismatic, goofy face had me hooked. As we became friends, I grew to realize the importance of being a jury diver. Once we set sail to the HMS Repulse, we won't have a chance to go back to shore and pick up additional equipment. So preparing for a wrecked dive at this depth 
requires quite a bit of gear. There are gas tanks to fill, scooters to check, backups to be arranged the lot. As part of the team, I help Leon out with organising the gear. I'm also a trained GUE diver, a newly appointed dive instructor, which means we have to be able to manage our equipment, proper configurations and double check everything. All of our equipment is configured in a certain way to make it easy for us to complete the dive task and if need be, respond to emergencies. Everything from the regulators, wetsuits, harness, back plates, lights, pressure gauges and over 30 other items are prepared and painstakingly checked. It may seem inconsequential for a leisurely dive, but in an emergency it makes all the difference. Before I dive, I like to read out about the wreck to gain perspective. Force Z was a code name for the Royal Navy Force dispatched to Singapore to deter a possible seaward invasion by the Japanese. There were six ships that formed Force Z. Four destroyers, the Express, Electra, Vampire and Tornados that escorted Britain's powerful capital ships the Prince of Wales and Repals. About 70 years ago, the main style of Force Z was the Prince of Wales. Completed in 1941, the Prince of Wales was one of the world's most modern fighting ships with two turrets of four 14-inch guns. To support these guns, Prince of Wales also had 16 5.25 guns and 60 two-pounder anti-aircraft guns. Her armoured hull varied in thickness from 4.5 inches to 15 inches with a top speed of 29 knots. But there was another battlecruiser in Force Z by the name of the HMS Repulse. The Repulse was a renowned class battlecruiser of the Royal Navy. Built in 1914, she had a deadly reputation in the First World War as a voracious hunter of German battleships. Her motto was, whoever touches me is broken. Although the ship hands affectionately referred to her as the HMS Repair because of the numerous refits she underwent. Compared to the Prince of Wales, the repulse of short of deck armour, which at its maximum was 4 inches, not enough to protect against an aerial attack. However, at 26,500 tonnes, Repals carried six 15-inch guns, 12 4-inch guns, and 4-inch anti-aircraft guns. Despite this aging ship, it was the captain of the Repals that added power to her guns. Captain William Tennant was known by the ordinary sailors under his command as Dunkirk Joe for his efforts at saving 300,000 troops in Dunkirk. When he took charge of the HMS Repulse in June 1940, his men felt energised by his track record. And even though the Prince of Wales was a newer ship, the HMS Repulse was the old dog that never failed. Able Seaman Clarence Bourne, Midshipman's Mess HMS Repulse. My dearest Lorna, thank you so very much for your letter which I received the other day. But I've not been able to answer it before, but of course, I know you understand my position. Well, Lorne, I know that you've been having a very warm time of it up in London. I've been very worried about you. All I wish is that you are safe and well. I hope that you are keeping well. Also, your friend Daisy, it must be good to know that her husband is safe and well, even though he is a prisoner of war, and I hope they will be together once more. Mum told me that you're expecting a baby, and my hopes are with yours. So, good luck, Lorne, and my heartiest congratulations. Netra and I will be getting married soon, I expect. I will let you know when. But of course, Mum doesn't know that I intend to get married. I will tell her myself soon. Well, Lorne, I hope to see you the first chance I may get. I've not been ashore for seven months now, and I'm sure I've not the slightest idea when I should get home. Soon, I hope, anyway. Well, my dear, I hope to say cheerio for now. 
Sending you all my love from your ever-loving brother, Clary. P.S. Keep your chin up. Attention all Army personnel. You are coming to the end of the trip. Good luck, men. A memorial to Admiral Sir Tom Phillips and the officers and men of the Prince of Wales and Repulse was dedicated at St Andrew's Cathedral today. Silver-plated candle stands and a bronze cross were specially designed for the event. Contributors towards the memorial included Lady Phillips, the family of Lieutenant R.A. Hunting, who died on HMS Repulse, as well as Sir Winston Churchill, who sent ten pounds. At the request of Lady Phillips, the memorial service also mentioned her son, who lost his life in the months before war officially broke out in Malaya. The voices of British history are hidden behind these walls. The destruction of Forsyth and the HMS Repulse, which I will be diving to soon, continues to be a very controversial topic in Britain. Behind the reflections of stained glass windows, hidden in a corner of the church, is a small memorial to the HMS Repulse and Admiral Tom Phillips. So many contradictory thoughts are going on in my mind. Admiral Phillips was the highest ranking Allied officer killed in battle during the war. Old Tom Thumb, they called him. The desk bound Admiral who history blames for his refusal to break radio silence and ask for air cover to protect the beloved battleships of Churchill. But then again, blame can't sit squarely on him. Air cover was a precious resource and he felt that his battleships were strong enough to do the job. The men aboard the HMS Repulse, led by their Captain Tennant, managed to fight to the bitter end, but I don't see Captain Tennant's name mentioned here. It seems such an irony that the highest ranking officer who cost these men their ship is honoured alongside them. After all, Lady Phillips, Admiral Tom Phillips' mother, spearheaded the memorial project. These candelabra and bronze cross are in honour of her son, with the hundreds of other lives lost and afterthought. Another page in British history. Meanwhile, Ellen and Derek have gone to the northern tip of Singapore in Sembawang to piece together the last remaining days that the HMS Repulse spent at Her Majesty's dockyard. Standing off the coast of Sembawang Jetty, the story of Force Z takes on a new meaning. Walking in the steps of history, there's so much to see. I cross the street to Her Majesty's dockyard, a place that seems full of textures. I'm fascinated by the textures of what I see, instantly. I'm thinking of what camera angles will work, what depth of field to use. But instead of having my camera with me, this time I want to experience the visuals without the lens. After all, my father was a sailor, so he could say the sea is in my blood. There are stories behind this place. I'm taken back to the 1940s, watching the shipyard workers as they work on the HMS Prince of Wales that was in this very location. I step onto the pier, looking out at the Johor Strait. Imagine the small boats going out to the sailors on the HMS Repulse with food supplies. The sailors and officers must have been excited to reach Singapore. The mood must have been high. If you can imagine millions of pounds spent between the 1920s and 1940s to build Singapore as a fortress. In fact, Her Majesty's Dockyard in Sembawang was a major investment by the British naval forces. 
The aim was to maintain British naval power and to have a location that was able to service the largest battleships and dry dock them for repair. Here was Britain ready to defend her protectorate. On the 3rd of December, Rear Admiral Spooner gave a party in honour of Force Z. All the great textbook heroes were there. Newly appointed Admiral Sir Thomas Phillips, Captain John Leach of the HMS Prince of Wales, Admiral Bill Tennant, who commanded the HMS Repulse. Officers were in high spirits, dancing, drinking, plans of tennis and golf discussed. Can you imagine how oblivious they were to the fact that most, including an admiral, would have been sailing to the death in a few short days? I guess for every Singaporean, we've seen the guns at Fort Siloso pointing out to the sea, remnants of the British military base from World War II. The British had primarily prepared for a sea invasion. That explains why these guns point out to sea, to shoot down approaching Japanese ships. The Japanese did the exact opposite. The guns were turned 180 degrees inland to defend against a land invasion by the Japanese army in the west. However, it was a case of too little too late. Through the lens of history, we now know that the British underestimated the Japanese, and I guess Singapore bore the consequences. Fortress Singapore fell in stunning fashion, taking British pride and might with it. In these claustrophobic tunnels, imagine the thoughts going through the minds of the gunners and those loading the cannons. The constant sound of explosions, loading the muzzles, the smell of gunpowder in the air, the desperation as the enemy closed in. These tunnels even ran under the sea to Labrador Park, just across the mouth of the river. The real battlefield was actually miles away, up north out to sea at the very location we will be sailing to. I was opening my boxes when the telephone at my bedside rang. It was the first Sea Lord, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound. His Prime voice Minister, sounded odd. I have to report to you that the he Prince of Wales sort of and the Repulse and Gulf have been sunk by the Japanese. First, I could not think hear aircraft. quite clearly. Vice Admiral Tom Phillips is drowned. Are you sure it's true? There is no doubt at all. I put the telephone down, thankful to be alone. In all the war, I'd never received a more direct shock. As I turned over and twisted in bed, the full horror of the news sank in upon me. There were no British or American capital ships in the Indian Ocean 
all Pacific except the American survivors of Pearl Harbor, who were hasting back to California. Over all this vast expense of waters, Japan was supreme, and we everywhere were weak and naked. The key to the war in the Pacific is Singapore, and Britain's great naval base is the number one objective of the enemy assault. In between the logistical preparations, I steal some time to meet with Malcolm Moffat. He's a historian who's been teaching British and European history to a vast range of students at NUS for over 30 years. This is an important part of the diving process for me, as I want to understand the maritime history behind the wreck, which is not just a dive spot, but a war grave. Was an uh, aircraft carrier Mm. Uh, the Prince of Wales, the Repulse, and the Four destroyers. Uh, destroyers. Um, nobody really knew what it was meant to do. I mean, that's the thing. It's you know, uh, is it to deter? It's hardly, it's hardly a force that mm. will be a deterrent to the Japanese. If the IJN, if the Imperial Japanese Navy is going to come south, it's not going to be deterred by that force, and particularly not when there's no carrier. Mm. So. You have to ask yourself, once the Indomitable had run aground in the Caribbean, there was no carrier, no air cover, uh, what on earth were these ships going to do? Seriously, what on earth were they going to do? They're hostages for, to fortune. Mm. That's what they are. It was uh, a disaster that needn't have happened, unfortunately. <clears throat> This was a situation where the commander-in-chief of the Eastern Fleet was a desk-bound admiral who'd been at the Admiralty doing, pushing paper, making uh, plans, director of plans for a time, doing all kinds of stuff uh, that you did on a kind of like a nine-to-five basis oh, I see. and wasn't an active sailor. and. So the decision to, but he was, a, he was a friend of Churchill's, so the decision to appoint him as Commander-in-Chief of the Eastern Fleet was flawed from the outset. And the, the, the point was that a lot of people said, this should, he, Tom Phillips should never have commanded this particular fleet. Because, not because the man was inadequate, but just simply, out of touch. Mm. You have to be, you know, experienced ship handler. He was not mm. any longer. It was uh, the pride of the fleet. Mm. It was the latest of the battleships, but wait, the Prince of Wales and the battle cruiser repulse, um, and four destroyers, two fairly laboring and old mm. uh, versions, and two uh, fairly, you know, decent. Uh, destroyers were with it. But the question was, you know, what do you do when you, uh, when you hear that, uh, you know, uh, the Japanese have declared war and they're bombing Singapore? In the naval base, you know, those were the days of real tension, war. War was coming. In, in the dockyard, believe you me, I saw the Prince of Wales, the pride of Britain. Oh, beautiful at that time. Supposed to be Britain's greatest battleship. Modern up to date. Oh, beautiful. Of course, I couldn't get inside. I just stood from my, you know, the outside. Because our office is just next to the dockyard, you see. And besides that, I was typing all the movements. <laughs> And the repulse also. You remember these two were the world famous historical ships sunk by the Japs. And these are all spectacles I will not forget. And believe you me, during those hectic bombing days, you know, the Japanese planes were bombing non stop all over Singapore and especially the naval base. It was the real target. 
Oh, I, I think I, I really experienced a lot of, you know, fear, you know. Fear, but at that time you were young, you were not so frightened. You, you faced the challenge. The jet planes, you know, I believe the, that were fit columnists, you know, a lot. And they knew where to bomb the, the in a in the naval base when the planes came. They were aiming for the dockyard. You know? uh, now there were various things that Phillips could have done. He could have immediately set sail because obviously having the, sh having the ships here in Singapore where bombing was going on was obviously hugely dangerous. Mm -hmm. So he could have gone to the Dutch East Indies uh, to try and hide out there for a time. He could have gone towards Australia. Uh, he didn't do either of those things. Uh, he could have sailed into the, you know, to the Indian Ocean. He didn't do that either. He decided to sail to the sound of the guns. And, well, I mean, his intention was, and you can understand, perhaps, uh, the rationale of this, uh, he wanted to go and disrupt the landing Mm. at Songkla and Kota Bahu. Well, the problem is, how on earth, how long did he think the Japanese were going to take to disgorge, mm. you know, their invasion forces at these two uh, landing sites? So I think that decision is also flawed. Why go north? You know, um, he goes north, but he's spotted. He doesn't realise he's spotted. He's spotted by uh, a submarine uh, early on in the piece. Um, he's, he continues north uh, to the afternoon, uh, then around about tea time on the 9th of December, uh, he s clearly sees that there are now uh, reconnaissance planes that are, you know, hovering around, out of distance, you know, fire, but clearly, you know, has his coordinates uh, and so he spotted. So what does he do? He waits for night to fall and then he does a couple of, of uh, course maneuvers and then he turns back towards Singapore. Now, he might have got away with it on this occasion, but for him receiving around about midnight uh, an unconfirmed report saying that there's a landing at Kwantan. Mm. Japanese had landed at Kwantan, and so he steams down the eastern coast of, of Malaya uh, and decides to investigate because obviously he can't get to Kodabaru now, he can't get to Songla now, but he can get to Kwantan. So he roars towards Kwantan and gets there about 8 o'clock in the morning. Obviously, no invasion fleet is taking place. Mm. Now, at that point, when it's obvious that there is no invasion going on, you would have thought that he would then say, OK, we now must press on, full steam ahead for Singapore. He doesn't. Mm. He hangs for two hours uh, around Quantan, and then only at about 10.15 does he set off south. You can't figure it. Nobody can figure it. I mean, it's an absurdity. You know, and the result is that as he's going south from Quanta, uh, he's spotted mm. by a lone reconnaissance plane that is off course, that is short of fuel and decides to go back the shortest way to base. Mm. And fortuitously for the Japanese, mm. uh, and obviously a, a dastardly piece of luck for the, the British, he spots these... Uh, these ships mm. and uh, well, the two, the battleship and the battle cruiser, because the the uh, destroyers have already been sent off mm. uh, south. So uh, then, within an hour, in about 58 minutes after uh, the reconnaissance plane off course and short of fuel uh, gets radios the coordinates, um, the first of the wave of bombs come from torpedo bombers from uh, the Japanese. Mm. Uh, there are two sets uh, of, of 
Mel uh, uh, torpedo bombers and then Betty uh, torpedo bombers, and, and they take an hour and 20 minutes to sink the repulse. Um, the repulse is first engaged at 11.13, uh, it sinks at 12.33, uh, the Prince of Wales goes down at 13.20. Mm. All this time, um, Titch Phillips um, is not radioing to Singapore oh. for air cover. He doesn't radio ever for air cover. It's only when the Brewster uh, Buffaloes come mm. from Singapore that uh, they arrive just as they see the Prince of Wales sinking. Mm. Uh, that's just a, you know, a disaster. Uh, 840 people die mm. um, for decisions that were flawed. Mm. And Churchill, you know, uh, is regarded as a great premier. Uh, and undoubtedly was in terms of his psychological uh, impact. Strategically, he often made a number of grievous mistakes throughout his career. This was one of them. Mm -hmm. No question at all. I mean, it's all very well saying, oh, we'll send them to show the flag. But that's about all that it was doing. And it's hardly some flag showing if the ships sunk you know, within days of arriving. Mm. Doesn't give any cause for optimism to the Singaporeans. You have to say that um, the, the whole affair was just inadequately mm. uh, organized, you know, and, and showed uh, really a, a lack of real coordinated thought, I think. Um, what I do believe is mm. that if the aircraft carrier had been there, it would have been an entirely different ball game. Mm. Entirely different ball game. Um, but even so, uh, one aircraft carrier's complement of, of uh, aircraft uh, wouldn't necessarily have, uh, have uh, kept the Japanese at bay mm. for any length of time. Okay. okay. We'll talk about the wreck a little bit more as the rain intensifies. Little do I know that this weather will follow me all the way to the northeastern coast of Malaya. We are about to sail off on the MV dive race. Hours before the divers arrive, I meet with the boat crew and boat owner Lionel. Thai chef Woon has just been buying half the supermarket with Lionel. Dive hand Sam surveys the plastic bags to see if Woon has purchased the special request, such as watermelons and tom yum noodles for me. Chef Woon is a stickler for fresh ingredients and his cooking is a great morale booster on tiring trips. Lionel and his Thai crew have a helpful nature. As I load up each diver's personal equipment, Sam, the dive hand, helps to secure the gas tank. Even Sam's wife, who is the ship's massage therapist, pitches in to load the boat. The human element is very important on trips like this because stress is high and when the stress levels get high, friction tends to increase and tempers start to flare. So crew pulling in the right direction definitely helps everybody. While everyone is busy boarding the boat, I try to find some quiet time up on the deck. I'm running through in my mind a conversation with Malcolm Murphy, the historian. 
I mean, I'm not aware of absolutely categorically, and no, neither is anybody else, mm -hmm. of how many hits there were. It was alleged there were five hits. Mm -hmm. Four port side, uh, one starboard side. And the starboard side one is confirmed, and one of the um, uh, torpedoes that hit by the propellers is confirmed mm -hmm. on the port side. The other three are not. So, uh, and I'm not sure that uh, Leon's going to be able to determine that yeah. because it's 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 a lot down of it's in the sand. In, in the sand. Mm. Um, so, uh, w who knows what it would have done? Yeah, I mean, done. it's 140 uh, feet uh, at its its shallowest mm. part. So it's a it's a decent amount of, of thing, but it's a big down ship. I, d I, I don't see it going over twice, but somehow. If that's the case, it, it would have just fallen yeah. that way. Yeah, I think. After all, you know, it was 35,000 tons. Mm. So, I mean, I don't know. I've never seen anything go through water, you know, that is as big as 35,000 tons. Mm. I have absolutely no idea what kind of speed it would go down. Mm. If, I can't imagine it doing this. Yeah, I mean, probably not. No. Just one turn. Yeah. The Prince of Wales actually is completely upside down. Yeah. That had a bit more depth to yeah, turn yeah, over. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. If there was some way that you could determine whether any of these other hits, mm. these other two hits, uh, were, um, were, were actually there or not, that mm. would be really... I, I try and have a look. We'll definitely spend some time yeah. going around. Because we, we the, the, the ship is like that. Yeah. Sometimes we go under the yeah. gunwale just a bit yeah. and have a look. Uh, that's where the superstructure is. But up at the bow where it's flat, yeah. we, there is quite a fair bit of space there. Mm. Um, from the looks of it, as we enter here, there's a little slope that goes down mm -hmm. in line with the angle of the boat. Yeah. And that drops another five or six meters. Right. So I presume on the hull yeah. in the midships, yeah. they'll probably go even deeper than that. Yeah. Six to eight meters yeah. or so. This entire trip has been 20 years in the making. During my school holidays, I would pour through dive magazines and books. I remember very clearly picking up this book about scuba diving. And the first page that really caught my eye was of the HMS Repulse and Prince of Wales. I remember that feeling as I thumbed through the pages thinking, oh man, I really got to do this. I really got to dive this wreck. For me, the most important part of this trip will be capturing amazing shots of the wreck and trying to choreograph the laying of the reef on the repulse with all our divers. After all, 500 people died there and it's only right that we approach the filming with respect. Before going on the trip, I emailed my dad about the HMS Repulse. It turns out that my grandfather was in the British Army and based in Malaya in the 1950s. Dad remembers sailing over the site of the wreck when he was a child. And he's even got some black and white photos to prove it. Looking at these black and white photos of Gran and Dad when he was a child, it seems clear to me that it's a family tradition to be tied to the HMS Repulse.
While the crew and the dive team enjoy themselves before heading out, the words of Malcolm ring in my head as we plan the dive objectives. However, the journey to the HMS Repulse is not going to be a smooth one at all. Tragedy, rain and strong currents threaten the divers as Sam and Muslim our dive hands fight against the elements to save us. The Repulse won't give up her secrets easily, but the Living Seas Divers are up to the challenge. <laughs> 